Hi, and welcome to Celebration Church. Thanks for joining us for this online service. We're about to worship together and hear a message of hope from the Bible. If you're new with us, no matter what age, please write new in the comment section so we can welcome you and your family. Here at Celebration, we are dedicated to partnering with our parents to teach children, middle schoolers, and teens about the Lord and to bring them closer to Christ. To find more information about our kids and teens ministries, please open our digital worship guide at webcc.info. In fact, when you open webcc.info, you will find today's sermon notes. Use them as a guide to help you during service. Right now, let's join together for a time of worship.
Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you, O God, for the great things that you're doing, not only today, but that you're continuing to do. Father, thank you so much that we get this opportunity to come before you. We worship you. We honor you. We bless your name. Thank you for the price that was paid for our freedom by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that we can have an eternal life with you. Father God, we ask right now, even in the midst of all that's going on, that you'll continue to show up and show out in ways we haven't even imagined yet. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity once again that we get to work worship you in spirit and in truth. We seal all of this in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
Welcome to Celebration Church. We're glad you joined us today, whether in person or online. This is our third week of relaunching our live services and campuses are continuing to phase in Kids Town Ministry. If you chose to keep your child with you and have a mobile device and headphones, this is a great time to let your child watch our Kids Town Ministry video posted on the YouTube channel for this Celebration Church campus. Our digital worship guide can be found at webcc.info. Once there, you can find today's sermon notes, submit a prayer request, and make reservations for next weekend's worship service. To reserve your spot for next weekend, open webcc.info, click on the News and Events tab, and scroll down to the button which reads, Reserve Your Seat Now. It will allow you to reserve your spot by campus and service. After the sermon today, we'll be participating in communion together. If you are physically attending today's service, you should have received a pre-packaged communion cup. If you did not, please raise your hand so one of our ushers can bring one to you. If you're attending online, this is a great time to prepare some bread and juice so you can participate as well. We appreciate those who are able to continue to give during this time. Jesus once said, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full press down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. That's a great promise from the Lord. If you would like to give today, you can drop your offering off later as you exit. You can also give by texting the word GIVE and the dollar amount to 504-380-9939. You can find that number at the Give Online tab at webcc.info. Thank you so much for giving. Summer is here, guys. Uh, isn't that great? Staying up late, going to the beach, maybe going camping. But how about summer camps? Summer camps offer vacation for kids and for parents. Our schedules not only include regular fun-filled activities, but this year we're also adding in a bit of learning. And don't worry guys, it'll be fun for everybody. While preparing for uh, our hot days, we still have our Olympic sized swimming pool, outdoor water activities, and field trips as well. So let's get this summer going. Call today to register at 504-885-4700. Let's make this a summer you'll never forget. For more information about our church and ministries, see celebrationchurch.org or one of our social media platforms. Thanks for joining us today at Celebration Church, where God is met, love is felt, and lives are changed. I want to welcome you here today and tell you just how grateful we are to have you worshiping with us, whether you're worshiping with us in person, whether you're worshiping with us online. Thank you so much for joining us for today's worship service. I also want to tell you at the end of today's service, we're going to celebrate communion together. And so as you're watching online, please be sure to get your beverage together, your bread or your crackers together so you can participate with us in communion at the end of today's service. I want you to take your Bible, your Bible app, and turn with me to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John and the first chapter. Several weeks ago, we began a new series titled Real Christians in a Challenging World, or Real Christianity in a Challenging World. We learned how real Christians are people who stand up for what is right. And real Christians are those who live, joy who live joyful lives. And today's message is titled Real Christians are those who get right with God. Now, there have been times when all of us haven't wanted to be right with God or get right with God, but the Bible says that it's when we get right with the Lord. That's when we experience the joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, and the victory of the Lord in our lives. So follow along as I begin reading in 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. The Apostle John said, This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we're living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves. We're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all sin unrighteousness or wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, my dear children, John says, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. As I mentioned earlier, we've been learning from the Apostle John how to be real Christians in a challenging world. 
We've learned how to stand up for the Lord. And last week, we learned how to live joy-filled lives. Last week, we learned how fellowship with other Christians helps us to have more joy in our life. But we also learned that fellowship with the Lord brings more joy to our lives. John said in 1 John 1, 3, and 4, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. John was telling us that fellowshipping with the Lord is one of the keys to living a joy-filled life, one of the keys to living a vibrant and victorious life. Now, now we also learned last week that fellowship with the Lord, I experienced fellowship with the Lord through spending time with Him, spending time with Him in worship, spending time with Him in prayer, spending time with Him in studying His Word. And we learned that fellowship with the Lord comes from living for the Lord, not living for ourselves or living for others, but, but living for the Lord. Now, in today's Scripture passage, John is emphasizing that we can only live for the Lord And we can only experience close fellowship with him if we learn how to overcome sin and guilt in our lives. Now, we all know what sin is all about because we've all been sinners. We all are sinners. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is making the wrong choices. Sin is doing what we know we shouldn't be doing or not doing what we know we ought to be doing. We've all sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. But what is guilt? Guilt is that feeling or or, or sense of self-condemnation that results when we when we violate our moral convictions in our lives. You see, God's created all of us, every single one of us, with a conscience and a capacity to feel guilt. I was reading a story the other day about a man in New York City who snatched a woman's purse and he ran down the street. But she quickly called 911, identified the man, and the police were able to quickly apprehend him. They brought him back to the woman uh, for a positive ID. And when the thief heard the words positive ID, all of a sudden he blurted out, yes, officer, that's the woman I stole the purse from. Obviously, that wasn't the smartest of thieves. But obviously, he was struggling with a guilty conscience. A guilty conscience is something almost all of us struggle with at some time in our lives. Now, now guilt brings with it many problems. It always produces anxiety and feelings of inferiority or fear or worry. But guilt's also a major factor in psychological and emotional problems. And if left unresolved, the uh, people tell us that guilt can lead to self-destructive behavior and can damage all the relationships around us. In fact, one prominent psychiatrist said that 70% of people in hospitals today would become well if they just knew how to address and resolve their guilt. Now, most guilt is negative. Most guilt is not bad for us. It's unhealthy for us. But there actually is one kind of guilt that is good for us. God often utilizes the right kind of guilt. We Christians call it conviction to draw us to him and to help us get right with him. In the Bible, we find the story of King David. He's the most prominent man in the Old Testament. He was a great giant slayer, the military hero, and the greatest king of Israel that Israel ever had. But but there was a time in his life when David gave in to sin. He committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. Then after that, when she became pregnant, uh, he actually had her husband Uriah killed in battle. David thought he could get away with that because... After all, he was the king, Uh, but he couldn't get past the conviction that came from the Lord. So David had to turn back to the Lord and repent of his sins and get right with God. And listen to what David said after he took those steps. He said in Psalm 32, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable and I groaned all day long. Some of you know those feelings. He said, day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. I've been there. Maybe you've been there in your life. And then he said, my strength evaporated like water in the summer. But finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. And guess what? You forgave me and all my guilt is gone. Did you notice the joy, the relief, the peace, that victory, the victory that David had when he acknowledged his sin, when he sought forgiveness from the Lord, and when he was absolved of his guilt? You and I need to learn how to do that as well if we're to live a life of fellowship and joy with the Lord. So what can we do to overcome our guilt and to get right with the Lord? Several things I want you to take note of on your study guide. Uh, it's at webcc.info. First of all, getting right with the Lord requires understanding the sources of our guilt. Let me ask you a question. Who or what causes us to struggle with guilt in our lives? There are several sources of guilt. Uh, but one is good and the, other are, the others are not so good. But let me just bring them to your attention. First of all, sometimes guilt comes from the manipulations of society. Have you ever noticed that some individuals are good at giving other people guilt trips. One guy said to me this week, he said, my mama was the guilt trip queen. Uh, Some people can make you feel so guilty that that they actually get you to do what they want you to do. 
Parents are often good at using, utilizing guilt to manipulate others. Little Johnny was sitting at a dinner table. He had a plate of spinach in front of him. His mother said, little Johnny, I want you to hey, eat your spinach. Like most boys, little Johnny didn't like spinach. He says, hey, I, Mama, I don't want to eat my spinach. So his mother tells him about the starving children in Africa who don't have anything to eat. And Johnny's thinking, I'll give those starving children my spinach if they're hungry and they need something to eat. But because he feels guilty, Johnny will eat his spinach. His mother has manipulated him through guilt. Teens are experts at using manipulative guilt. They'll come to their parents and say, Mom and Dad, man, can you believe what Billy's parents bought him a new car for graduation? Well, I wish I had parents like Billy. That's manipulative guilt. It's the same tactic that people use with each other when they say, if you love me, you'll do this. If you'll love me, you do that. Lots of people manipulate other people with guilt to get them to do what they want them to do. Manipulative guilt results from the selfishness of others, and it's harmful to us in our lives. Sometimes guilt, comes from the, sometimes guilt comes from the manipulations of society. Sometimes guilt comes from the accusations of Satan. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, the accuser, speaking of Satan, the accuser has been thrown down to earth, the one who accused our brothers and sisters before our God day and night. And that verse reminds us that the devil is constantly accusing people. He's constantly bringing up our past sins, our past mistakes. He's constantly working to make us feel guilty so that we, will, uh, so that we won't have a close relationship with the Lord, so that we will stay away from the Lord. His accusations are designed to, to get us to give up on our relationship with the Lord. What happens is when we do make mistakes, and we all do, when we do sin, and we all will, Satan comes to us and reminds us of how bad that is and how, what God thinks about our sin, and, and it causes us to think that, that we're never again going to have a right relationship with God. But we need to remember this, the devil is a liar. Jesus said the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. So every time the devil tries to condemn us or put us on a guilt trip, we, we have to determine not to listen to his lies. Now, it may be that we have sinned. It may be that we have made a mistake. It may be that we have messed up in our life. Uh, but the guilt that comes from God is not intended to, to, to shame us or, or to condemn us. It's intended to drive us back to him while Satan will come along and use that same thing to drive us away from the Lord and to cause us to think God won't forgive us or God won't love us or, or God can't use us again sometime in the future. The great Christian leader, Martin Luther, was once attacked by the devil. He was a leader of the Protestant Reformation, but he was attacked by the devil in a dream. One night he was asleep, and in his dream, he woke up. In his dream, he saw Satan at the foot of his bed, and Satan had a big scroll, and on that scroll were all the sins ever committed by Martin Luther. And for emphasis, the devil went down through those sins, pointing this sin out and that sin out, and that sin out and that sin out. And, and Martin Luther said he felt like, as he looked at all the sins he'd ever committed, he felt like his salvation, his relationship with the Lord was going away. And the devil asked him, what makes you think that you are even a Christian with all these sins in your life? But the Holy Spirit of God whispered to Martin Luther and said, tell the devil to unroll the scroll. Uh, Martin Luther said to the devil in his dream, unroll the scroll. The devil refused to do so. And so Martin Luther said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to unroll the scroll. And so the devil unrolled the entire scroll. And at the bottom of the scroll, written in red, were these words, this entire sin account of Martin Luther paid in full by the blood of Jesus. I'm telling you, the devil doesn't want you to see the entire scroll. He doesn't want you to know. That God will forgive you, and God will free you, and God will transform you, and God will welcome you back. Sometimes guilt comes from the accusations of Satan. Sometimes guilt comes from the convictions of God's Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convince the world of his sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. You know, one way you can know that you're a Christian is that when you do sin, when you do fall short of the glory of God, when you do disobey the Lord or rebel against the Lord, you feel convicted about that in your heart. You feel something t telling you or someone telling you that's wrong. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have had that attitude or been involved in that action. and shouldn't have had that ambition. That's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You see, if you're really a Christian, when you mess up, you feel conviction in your heart. The Holy Spirit will remind you, that's wrong. That's not how a child of God should act. That's not how a child, what, how a child of God should talk, how a child of God should be. Satan's accusations come along and try to drive us away from the Lord, but the conviction of the Spirit comes to drive us back to the Lord, to make us realize that we need to renew our fellowship with the Lord, our relationship with the Lord. You see, the Lord cannot sit back and merely allow us to continue in our sin until we destroy ourselves and the relationships around you. 
In fact, God actually graces us with guilt to get us to turn back from our way and to turn back to him in order to keep us from destroying our lives and our relationships with our sin. But when we refuse to respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction, I mean, then the, the, that's when we begin to have a hardened heart. That's the kind of guilt that David was experiencing. And that's the kind of guilt that some of you are experiencing right now. You need to know that the guilt that comes from the Holy Spirit is not to drive, designed to drive us away from the Lord. It's designed to drive us back into a right relationship with the Lord. You see, God doesn't want us to carry that guilt any longer. He doesn't want us to carry that condemnation for the rest of our lives. He doesn't want us to carry that shame any longer. All of us have failed. We've all made bad choices. And while our guilty conscience condemns us, when dealing with guilt, we must always remember that God is greater than our sins and God is greater than our mistakes that he loves us and he's always willing to forgive us and to restore us so getting right with god requires understanding the sources of our guilt but also it requires uncovering the sins of our guilt identifying and then uncovering the sins of our guilt now the first impulse of the average christian is to cover up his or her sin you've heard the old adage to err is human to forgive divine i would say to err is human and to try to cover it up is also human we oftentimes try to conceal our sins or our flaws or the guilt that we have in our life. But look at what 1 John 1 says. It says, first of all, our guilt will be exposed by the light of the Lord. It will eventually be exposed by the light of the Lord. John says in 1 John 1, 5, God is light and, in him, and there is no darkness in him at all. That verse tells us there's absolutely no imperfection whatsoever in God. He is without sin. He's holy. And because he's holy, the Bible says he can't tolerate sin. And so he sends his light into our life to expose the darkness of our lives. I mentioned David and his sin a couple of times. Remember, David committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba, then had the husband of the woman he committed adultery with killed in battle. Some of you, if you hear that story, you're thinking, man, I'm not so bad. Now, because he was a king, David thought he could get away with it. Uh, but one day, Nathan the prophet, David's pastor, uh, showed up at his door. He knocked at his door, and David sent one of the servants to open the door, invited Nathan in, and thinking Nathan didn't know anything about what had happened. Now, Nathan didn't come and try to beat David over the head with a Bible. Uh, what he simply did was he began to tell David a story. He said, oh, king, there's something that's happened in your kingdom that you need to judge. He said a poor man had a pet sheep, and one of his neighbors was a rich man who had lots of sheep. Well, one day the rich man had a guest or visitor come to his house, and instead of taking one of his sheep and killing that sheep and barbecuing that sheep for the festival or the feast that he threw, he took the poor neighbor's poor sheep, only sheep, and he took that man's sheep and he used it for his barbecue. And David was aghast that anybody would do something like that. He rose to his feet and clenched his fist. He said, that man should die. At least he will have to pay back four times more than what he took. Have you ever noticed that those with the greatest sins are those who are often willing to point out the flaws and the failures and the mistakes of others. You see, it was a serious thing to steal another man's sheep, but it was a more serious thing to steal another man's wife. It was a serious thing to kill another man's sheep. It was even a more serious thing to kill another human being. Nevertheless, David was mad because of the story Nathan had told. So he said, that man, he's going to have to pay at least fourfold. And Nathan pointed his finger in David's face and said, you are the man. Now, here is the point of that story. David thought he'd gotten away with his sin. Maybe you sometimes think that you get away with your sin, but God knew what David had done, just like God knows what I've done, and God knows what you've done. He knows what all of us have done, and at just the right time, the Lord is going to point out our failures. He's going to convict us of our sins. He's going to shine his light upon the failures of our lives. And Moses said, be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Man, I had that explained to me, illustrated to me very poignantly many years ago. I was actually leading a group of people uh, down Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. They'd come from my home state of Florida. They wanted to see the French Quarter. They wanted to see Bourbon Street. And so we were walking down the center of Bourbon Street so they wouldn't get contaminated by the bars and the strip clubs on either side when all of a sudden a 60-year-old woman in the group with us darted into one of the strip joints. I was aghast. I didn't know, what, what do I do? Do I need to go in and get her? Do I, uh, what do I need to do? And, and I, did, I was just stunned for just a moment. I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, she came out dragging a little bald-headed man by the ear. She had him by the ear, and she was pulling him outside. And I heard her shouting at him, and here's what she said. I know you. You are so-and-so deacon at so-and-so Baptist church in Tallahassee, Florida. When the barker had thrown open the door so people could look into the strip club, she had looked in and saw him at that moment where he shouldn't have been in his life. 
And I was reminded that day, as that guy slunk away into the crowd, his head was as red as a ripe tomato. I was reminded, God knows where we are. He knows what we're doing. He knows what's going on in our lives. And he knows how to call us out and expose us at the right time. Our guilt will be exposed by the light of the Lord. Our guilt will also be exposed by the lies we tell. Now, in 1 John chapter 1, John talks a lot about lying. In verses 6, 8, and 10, all, they all begin the same way. If we say we have no sin. And John is saying there that Christians sometimes try to conceal their sins through lying. Have you ever done that? I have, and probably so have you. Now notice this. When we try to conceal our sins, we oftentimes find ourselves lying to other people. John says in verse 6, we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not living in the truth. Here's John's talking about a person who's let sin come into his or her life, and they're lying to other people in order to conceal their sin. We've all done that with our words, sometimes with our actions. People ask you, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, when we're really not doing fine. How's your spiritual life? My spiritual life is good, when really we know it's not good. Uh, We know it's not okay. Uh, Some of you uh, listen to this message, they are living a lie. You're pretending to be spiritual and godly as you worship the Lord, but, but when you go back to your home or go back to your work or go to a parade or get on your computer, uh, you're, you're a much different person. You're lying to others in order to conceal the sin and guilt in your life. And then sometimes when we, uh, we lie to others, we, when we try to conceal our sins, we, we, we find ourselves lying to ourselves. John says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. You know, I've learned that a person can live in a fantasy world long enough that she or he or she has difficulty separating fact from fiction. Many a Christian who's once devoted to the Lord has slipped away from the Lord, but they lie to themselves. They say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm better than others. I'm doing okay. I, I, they make all kinds of excuses. They're lying to themselves to make themselves feel better. I've learned that some people refuse their guilt. Some people abuse their guilt. While some people excuse their guilt. Some people refuse the guilt. They just block out the guilt from their minds. Some people abuse their guilt. They're like the puppy who tucks his tail every time anyone raises their voice. And some people excuse their guilt. They act like they're not responsible for their sins and their wrongdoing. Honestly, over the years, I've had more people, I think, try to excuse their guilt and blame it on others rather than acknowledging the guilt and the sin in their life. They blame their parents. They blame their children. They, they blame their siblings. They blame their coworkers. They blame their spouse or their ex-spouse. They blame God. They blame the devil. They blame the church. But in every one of those cases, they never were willing to come to grips with their problems. They are lying to themselves. And then when we try to conceal our sins, we find ourselves lying to our Lord. John said in verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. You see, some people lie to God. All kind of ways. Sometimes by changing the terminology that describes their condition. They say, oh, I'm not just a, I'm not a sinner. I'm just struggling with a sickness. I'm not deceitful. I'm just doing what I have to do to make it in today's world. I, that's not, I'm not committing adultery. That's just a harmless flirtation or a one night stand. I don't have anger problems. That's just righteous indignation. I'm not gossiping about others. I'm just asking people to pray for them. We try to deny our sin by explaining it away. But listen, our lives will never work with God. He will expose our lies and the guilt that we have in our lives. And then our guilt will also be exposed by losses in our life. In 1 John 1, 3 and 4, it tells us again about fellowship with the Lord. It tells us when we try to conceal our sins and guilt, we wind up losing that fellowship with the Lord. And when we lose our fellowship with the Lord, we lose joy in our lives. We lose a peace of God in our lives. We lose a close relationship with the Lord in our lives. When you have unconfessed sin and you refuse to deal with it, I'm telling you, that, that's the most miserable time in a Christian's life. You won't have any peace. You won't have any joy. You won't have any purpose. You won't have any power. And First John says we're to be living the joyful life, but when we're out of fellowship with the Lord, when we're struggling with guilt, uh, there's no joy to be found anywhere. That's why David said in Psalm 51, Lord, will you please restore to me the joy of my salvation? I'm telling you, when we are out of fellowship with the Lord, when we're staying in, in, in continual sin, it costs us so much in our lives. I was reading the other day about uh, dumb crooks, you know, crooks who make big mistakes in their lives. Uh, There was a guy in Kenner. He actually went to hold up a convenience store. While he had the gun on the cashier, he noticed some alcohol in the back row, and he said, listen, I want some of that alcohol. And she said, no, it looks like you're too young to drink alcohol. So he produced his driver's license to prove to her he was old enough to drink alcohol. She remembered it, and the police were able to apprehend him shortly thereafter. 
I think about a guy in Memphis who went to break into a, an alcohol store and so he took a cinder block and tried to throw it through the window, but he didn't realize the window was plexiglass, not just glass, and the brick rebounded and hit him in the head and knocked him out, and he was still out when the police arrived. I heard about a guy up in Seattle, Washington. He was attempting to siphon some gasoline out of someone's, uh, someone's RV, someone's motorhome, but he put his siphoning hose into the sewage tank rather than the gas tank, and when the police arrived, he was still curled up in a fetal position. They had to take him to the hospital before they could take him to jail. Listen, when you give yourself to a life of sin, here's what I'm telling you, the consequences of that sin, the catastrophe that comes along with that sin, the cost of that sin are far greater than the joy and and pleasure you get from that sin. Getting right with the Lord requires understanding the sources of our guilt, uh, uncovering the sins behind our guilt, but also overcoming our struggles with guilt. Now look at 1 John 1, 9. You need to memorize this verse because you're going to need to use it time after time after time. It says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness or wickedness in our lives. Now, here's what that tells us. It tells us that conquering of our guilt requires confessing our sins. It says, if we confess our sins to him. Now, the Bible says when we have guilt in our lives, we need to confess that sin, not to a priest, not even to a pastor, but we need to confess it, first of all, to a Lord, to the Lord. Now, there is value in confessing our sins to other Christians. The Bible says in James 5, 16, that brings healing to our lives. But when it comes to getting right with God, we only have to confess our sins to him. That word sins there, or word confession there, or confess, is a Greek word homologeo. It simply means to agree with it. It means to agree with God about the wrongfulness of our sins. And by the way, if we don't know what sins to confess, we can ask the Lord to reveal them to us. And the Holy Spirit does a good job of doing that. So what does it take to really confess our sins? First of all, biblical confession involves agreeing with God about the wrongfulness of our sin. Agreeing with God, uh, the, uh, saying, God, I agree with you. This was a wrong attitude, a wrong ambition. This was a, this was a wrong thing that I've been a part of or a wrong thing that I've done. When I was a boy, I grew up watching the sitcom Happy Days. And on, sit, on Happy Days, there was this cool guy named Fonzie. And uh, Fonzie was good, and he was great, and he was cool. But there was one thing he couldn't do. He couldn't say that he was wrong. In fact, people would try to get him to admit that he was wrong, and he would say, okay, I'm, er, er. He, couldn't, he couldn't say the word wrong. Listen, we all have to come to the place where we acknowledge the wrongfulness of our lives, uh, the sin that's in our lives. To get right with God, we've got to confess our sin. We've got, to, we've got to admit where we've been wrong or what we've done wrong. And then biblical confession involves repenting of those sins. The word repent is the Greek word metanoia. It, means, it doesn't mean to just to feel sorry for our sin, nor does it mean to do penance for our sins. It means to turn from our sinful way and to turn back to God's way. That's repentance. And then biblical confession involves forsaking by God's power the ways of our sin. Now, some of you are thinking, you'll never be able to overcome that hurt that you have in your heart. You'll never be able to overcome that lust or bad habit that you have in your life. You'll never be able to overcome that problem or this problem. But, but let me remind you what the Scripture says. It says in Philippians 4.13, I can do All things through Christ who strengthens me. Say that with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means you can overcome that anger problem. You can let go of that bitterness. You can stop being so critical of others. You can overcome that depression, discouragement in your life. You can overcome that fear. You can overcome that lust problem or that lying problem or that pornography problem. You can overcome it if you want to. Because the Lord will give you the power you need to overcome every problem, every struggle, every stronghold. If you will just ask him to do so, and if you will allow him to do so. Some parents one time found their boy with his hand stuck in a vase. They couldn't get the hand out of the jar. They tried to pull it out. They put water in and butter in, trying to get it out. Couldn't get that boy's hand out of the vase. Finally, they had to break the vase. When they did they discovered the boy couldn't get his hand out of the vase because it was balled up into a fist, clutching a quarter. He wouldn't, unball, he wouldn't let, let, let his fist go because he wouldn't let go of that quarter, and so he couldn't get free until that, that happened. The reason some people stay in bondage and guilt all the time is because they're not willing to let go of that which is holding them back, that, that obsession, that practice, that, that attitude, or, or that person that's holding them back. But if we're willing to let go of that struggle or stronghold, the Lord will help us get free and stay free. And then the conquering of guilt requires receiving God's forgiveness. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Now, let me tell you something. There is nothing the Lord won't forgive us for if we turn to him in repentance, in humility, and in brokenness. 
If you'll have a broken heart, a broken spirit, a repented heart, the Lord will forgive you of each and every sin in your life. The Bible says, a broken and contrite heart, the Lord will not despise. And the Bible says this in, in Proverbs 28, 13, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess them and if they turn from them, they will receive mercy. That's a promise we have from the Lord. And then the conquering of guilt requires experiencing the Lord's cleansing our lives. It says in 1 John, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. By the way, the Bible says, when God forgives us, he gives us total forgiveness. It says in Psalm 103, he cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. It says in Jeremiah, uh, he, he, it says in Jeremiah, he remembers our sin no more. It says in Micah, he bears our sin beneath the depths of the sea. It says in Acts 3, that he uh, blots out our sin as though it never existed. All that tells us that's complete forgiveness. When God forgives our sin, he, ref- he, he wipes it out as though it never existed before in our lives. When I was a child, we didn't have video games to play with in the car. We had G.I. Joe soldier guys. We had little cars, matchbox cars, and we had a thing called an Etch-a-Sketch. I don't know if you've ever seen an Etch-a-Sketch, but it was, a, it was a poor substitute for today's iPad or iPhone or something like that. But an Etch-a-Sketch, you, you could take an Etch-a-Sketch and it had some buttons at the bottom and you could uh, do some squiggly lines there. And you could, if you were artistic, you could draw something. You could make something. I was always a poor artist. But the good thing at the end of it all is if you messed up, you could just take that Etch-A-Sketch and shake it and all of the flaws, all the imperfections, all those things would be gone as though they'd never happened. That's what happens to our sins. When we repent of our sins and confess them to God, he wipes them out as though they never existed. And when we experience God's mercy and cleansing our lives, our joy in the Lord is restored. Remember what David said, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. And what God did in David's life, what he's done in my life, what he's done in so many people's lives here at Celebration Church, he wants to do in your life. But you've got to be willing to admit and confess and repent and and surrender those things to the Lord. Now, some of you are wondering, why would God forgive our sins and remove our guilt? Why would he do that? Well, one reason is because he loves us unconditionally. He says in Jeremiah 31, I've loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. So, so no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you failed, no matter how many times you messed up in your life, the Lord still loves you with an everlasting love. But also, uh, he will forgive us and remove our guilt because our defense attorney, Jesus Christ, has paid the penalty for our sins. Remember what John said in 1 John 2, 1 and 2. He said, if you do sin, there's someone to plead for you before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who pleases God completely. He is the sacrifice for all of our sins. He takes away not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. That phrase, someone to plead for you, is actually the word advocate in the New King James Version. It's the Greek word parakletos, the same word that we get the, uh, the term Holy Spirit from in John 14, 15, and 16. It's used here in the context of a defense attorney. And what What John is saying is we have a defense attorney who's already paid the penalty for our sins. His name is Jesus Christ. Now, I know a lot of jokes. I know a lot of Boudreaux and Thibodeau jokes. I know a lot of pastor jokes. I also know a lot of lawyer jokes. But let me tell you, I I usually don't tell them because I've got some good friends who are attorneys. I've got some some attorney friends who love God and live for God. And Yes, there are such people like that, such attorneys like that. But let me tell you, the best attorney I know of is none other than Jesus Christ, God's son. And John is saying when we are ready to get right with the Lord, the Lord Jesus himself will step up as our defense attorney to plead our case. When the judge, the father, says he's guilty or she's guilty, the Lord Jesus says, I know that, but but I've already paid their penalty with my blood on the cross of Calvary, and I want you to absolve them of their sin. And let me tell you, the heavenly father always responds to the words and pleas of his son. Here's the bottom line. Jesus is always able to undo forgive and cleanse us from all the errors of the past. If we're willing to turn from our sin and turn to him and ask for forgiveness and repent of our sin and surrender our lives to him. One time an army chaplain was in Vietnam when a young man was brought in to the battlefront. This young man was obviously dying and the chaplain asked him, soldier, is there anything I can do for you? And the young soldier wouldn't respond to the chaplain's question. A few moments later, the chaplain asked again, young man, is there anything I can do for you? Again, there was no response from the soldier. 
But a third time, feeling really burdened about this young man who was dying, the chaplain approached him and asked him, young man, uh, let me ask you again, is there anything I can do for you? And the young soldier looked at him and said, chaplain, what I need is someone who can undo some things for me. That's what we all need. We need someone who can undo the mistakes of our life, undo the sins of our life, undo the, uh, undo the failures of our life. But that's who Jesus Christ is. And that's what Jesus Christ can do if we're willing to turn to him and confess our sins. Remember, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in our lives. We've just got to get to that place of conviction and that place of confession and that place of surrender to the Lord. When I was a young man, growing up in my parents' home, uh, first I rode a tricycle. That was my mode of transportation. Then I rode a bicycle for a number of years. Then we had horses, and I rode horses for a number of years. When I was a young teenager, my parents bought me a motorcycle. And boy, I had great times on that motorcycle, zipping up and down those country roads, jumping hills, and all kinds of things, playing like, uh, like I was a daredevil. My mom, actually, I would get home from school around 4 o'clock, and my mom would get home from work around 5 o'clock. And so my mom said to me, Dennis, I know you so enjoy riding your motorcycle, but I'm a, I don't want you to ride it when I'm not here, so wait till... I get home from work before you ride the motorcycle. I said, no problem, Mom. That's what I'll do. But you know me. If you, if you uh, set a boundary, I have to step over that boundary. I have to step over that barrier. And so uh, every day at 4 o'clock, I'd get home off the bus, and I'd get on that motorcycle. I'd zip up and down those country roads. I'd be back at 4.50, 10 minutes before my mother was to return from work. And when she came home, it seemed like everything was fine, everything was cool. I was in obedience to her. But one day, it, it rained a lot, like it's been raining here in South Louisiana, and I was driving that motorcycle. I don't know how fast I was going, but I was going really fast. I went right through a mud puddle, lost my way, and ran right into a tree. It, it knocked me out for just a moment, and, and I picked my, uh, I was laying there on the ground. My motorcycle was on the ground, and, and I was hurting so bad. And I was thinking about, man, I need to lie here until somebody comes along. And then I remember my mama is on her way home. And so I picked up that motorcycle, got back on it, even though I was in a lot of pain, Drove back to my house, put it in the garage, went to, went to the house and acted like nothing had happened. My mom came in, I was laying in bed, and she thought I was strange. She said, Dennis, what are you doing? Why are you laying in bed? I said, everything's fine, Mama. Everything's cool. It really wasn't. That night, in the middle of the night, they had to take me to the emergency room because I had broken ribs, I had fractured ribs, but I was trying to cover all that up. I was in so much pain. I was dealing with so much distress, uh, but I was trying to cover it all up. But once I admitted that I had a problem, once I confessed my sin, then I was able to get the help and the relief and the healing that I needed. That's what many of you need to do today. Quit trying to cover up all that sin, that junk that brings you so much hurt in your life, all that shame, all that guilt that brings you so much hurt in your life. Let the Lord know that you know that you've got a problem. Let somebody else know that you have a problem. Be willing to acknowledge your sin. Be willing to confess that guilt. Be willing to surrender to the Lord. And when you do, he will forgive you of every sin and begin to free you from every struggle, every stronghold you have in your life. Remember, John said, the blood of Jesus God's Son cleanses us from every sin. I want you to bow your head with me right now. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. In just a moment, we're going to be participating in communion together. But before we do, I want to ask you, are you struggling with any kind of guilt in your life? Let me just run down a list of things that lots of people struggle with. Do you struggle with anger? Do you struggle with bitterness? Do you struggle with a critical spirit? Do you struggle with fear or frustration? Do you struggle with guilt or greed? Do you struggle with hurt, hatred toward anybody else? Do you struggle with immoral thoughts? Do you struggle with jealousy? Do you struggle with lust? Do you struggle, sometimes are you just downright mean to other people with your words or with your actions? Do you struggle with pride or profanity or pornography? Do you struggle with rebelliousness? Do you struggle with selfishness? Do you struggle with unforgiveness? Or It could be any number of things. You know what you struggle with in your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you identify those things that hinder your fellowship with the Lord, that Hurt your relationship with the Lord. And then right now, be willing to confess them. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Lord to absolve you of your guilt. Ask the Lord to cleanse you of your sin. Ask the Lord to renew his relationship with you. And when you do, you'll find what David found. You'll find what I found. 
is that the Lord will forgive you of every sin. He'll cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. He'll bury your sins beneath the depths of the sea. He'll remember them no more. He'll blot them out as though they never existed. And you will find new joy and new peace and new purpose coming into your life. Just right now, ask the Lord to forgive you and cleanse you and help you in every way with those sins in your life. And you'll be amazed at how gracious, how loving, how forgiving, how freeing the Lord will be in your life. Now, you can't do that until Jesus Christ is the Savior and Lord of your life. So let me ask you this question. Have you made Jesus your Savior and Lord? I'm not asking if you believe in Jesus. I'm asking you, have you committed your life to him? Do you sense his presence in your life? Do you know that you're going to heaven? If you're not sure right now with our heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just pray with me in your heart? You say, what do I pray? Just pray this prayer and really mean it from the depths of your heart. Pray, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And I want to thank you for dying on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins and the sins of the entire world. But today I also want to ask you to forgive me. I want to ask you to come into my life and to begin the process of changing me. Take away my shame and my guilt, my hurt and my pain. And fill my life with your presence, your peace, your love and your joy. And help me to know that you have forgiven me of every sin. That you will help me to free me from the struggles and strongholds of my life. Help me to know how I can have joy in this life and joy in the next life. I pray these things with all of my heart. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, to commit your life to Christ or to rededicate your life to the Lord, please go to webcc.info down at the My my Decision tab and and let us know that you prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior or you are recommitting your life to the Lord. There may be some other steps you want to take. You know, oftentimes when people have been in sin, it's a good time to take a step of baptism. So that's a way of of renewing their commitment to the Lord. Maybe you want to take that step in the coming days or maybe you want to be a part of a life group, some other decision. Whatever it is, take a moment and download webcc.info and be sure to fill out some decision you have and share with us also any prayer requests that you might have. Just a moment. We're going to be participating in communion. But let me just lead us in prayer today. Lord, thank you for being a God who always loves us, always cares about us, who's always willing to forgive us of our sins and to welcome us back into a close fellowship with you. May may we not live a single day, a, a single day, with guilt, hurt in our lives. But every day, may we turn to you and find in you the forgiveness and the love and the cleansing and the freedom that we so desperately need. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hello, church family. Today, we're going to remember the price that Jesus paid for us by participating in communion. We'll do this with bread and grape juice. If all you have at home is crackers and water, that's fine. The elements themselves are not holy, they're symbolic. So get those items in front of you now so you can participate. You know, every one of us has a huge problem, and there's nothing any of us can do about it. That problem is sin. That sin sets us on a path of eternal separation from God. However, the Lord saw this and he demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In his death, Jesus paid the price for the bad things we have done. Observing communion is a formal way of us remembering what he did for us on the cross. So let's do that now. Let's remember. Go ahead and pick up your bread. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He broke it and he passed it around to his disciples and he taught them that it represented his body broken for them. He said, whenever you eat this, remember me. Please have your juice ready now. At the same time, Jesus took a cup. He passed it around to his disciples and he taught them that the contents of that cup represented his blood poured out for them. He said, whenever you drink this, remember me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving your life for us. Thank you for letting your body be broken and letting your blood be spilt out for us. Thank you for demonstrating your love for us by giving your life for us. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for loving us so very much. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a great service. If you pray with a pastor, if you would like to request a prayer, let us know at webcc.info by clicking on the appropriate tab. The Lord cares about you and we care about you. 
Filling out a prayer request will help our pastors and staff know how to pray for you and your family. Thanks again for joining us at Celebration Church, where God is met, love is felt, and lives are changed.